Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Jason Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. Welcome to those who are watching on the stream, the podcast, vidcast, however you're tuning into us. We welcome you as well. Uh, we just, if you're ever in the Mace area, please come hang out with us. We promise we'll make you feel just at home, won't we? And uh, if you haven't yet, get involved in our Bible study that we do every single morning, Monday through Friday. Uh, Pastor Scott and I do it. It's a scripture in the morning. We pray over your day. And you can find that on YouTube. It's called Wake Up. Or you could text the number that's on the screen right now, and they will get you signed up for that. We appreciate you being with us. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, and praise you for this morning. I ask, Lord, that you bless this time. Open up our hearts to receive your word, that your word is truth, it's seed. It's inspired, that it's changing, and it'll grow us, Lord, that your word is manna. It's practical. We can use it today. It's the bread of life. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. This morning, teach us what we need to know. Prepare us for what's coming in our lives. And Spirit of God, partner with me and help me speak truth. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Today, I want to talk to you about what is God's response to sin. Sometimes a, a pastor will bring a message that is encouraging and uh, reminding us of something maybe we need to remember about God's goodness. Or sometimes a pastor brings you a message about things you can do, work on. And, and, then, and then sometimes a pastor brings a word that might be there to correct and uproot wrong belief systems. Uh, today's message is more of the correcting kind of looking at the body of Christ and finding out that there are things that sometimes we believe that aren't true. And so we're going to look at the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was in place for 4,000 years, and the New Covenant now has been in place for 2,000 years. So sometimes that Old Covenant thinking has invaded, or it continues to echo in the churches today, or in the Christians out of our mouths and so we heard it, and maybe we bought into some of it. And specifically, what I want to talk about is God's response to sin under the new covenant and how it differs to his response to sin under the old covenant. And in this, I pray that our authority would be strengthened. And as we see God's divine nature revealed by his scripture and not by what your neighbor told you. That his divine nature, you can participate in that. So, so Paul was talking to the Galatians about mixing the old covenant with the new covenant. He was really upset with them. He said, who's be bewitched you? you know, and then he says this, let me ask you something again. Did you receive the Spirit and see the miracle power of God working because of something you did or because of what you believed? And I, I, I want to challenge you with this. It was one or the other. Either we see his power working because of faith or we won't see his power working because we're trying to earn it. In other words, when you take bits and pieces of old covenant mentality into your new covenant, you weaken or diminish your ability to see God manifest in your life because you put things between you and the cross. Oh, I've got to do a step to get to the cross, and yet the cross is available for free that anybody can come to it at any time by faith in Jesus and get whatever you need because everything you will ever need is at that cross. Yeah. Woo! Sometimes we, we put on others, we put on this nation, this idea that God is condemning and he's going to judge the sin that we see in a region or in a family or a person. They betrayed you, oh God, get them. <laughs> we see some calamity happening and we think, oh God, he's dealing with, he's judging. And he's dealing with sin right now. And what we're doing is we're bringing 4,000 years of an old covenant into a new covenant. We've got to rightly divide in our minds these things. And so I want to go to the scripture. We're going to start in the book of Hebrews and look to see 
how God is dealing with sin. I'm going to go in two directions because I want to be perfectly clear before we end today because everything I've been saying over the last three weeks has been leading up to next week's message. I said to the Lord, I want to teach this particular message on strength through adversity. And God said, sure, but I want you to teach this in for first. And he, he, he showed me the scripture that he wanted me to teach. And I said, sure. I was having lunch with Phil Godot on Friday. He's teaching the same thing we're learning. And so I know that the spirit of God, I talked to a youth pastor on Saturday morning. He said, I'm teaching my youth. My church is teaching the same thing that you just now said you're teaching. Why? Because God is dealing with cleansing the believers, our minds and our hearts, away from the old covenant. Because why? Because when I speak, I have power in my words. Now listen to me. And if I'm speaking condemnation or judgment to a region or to a people or to a family or a person, I divide my voice against God's intentions. What he's trying to accomplish, I'm dividing against. That's a scary thought. I want to align my will with his will, and I need his divine nature in my mind to be clear. How does God respond then to sin in a believer and in a non-believer? I want to talk about both. Okay, so Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 18. Now remember when Jesus came to us, and he, and he said, sacrifices and offerings you did not want, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, even though they were offered in accordance with the law. I know I'm going fast. And then he said, but as it is written according to your scroll, you have prepared a body for me. Here I am, I have come to do your will. So Jesus was saying in that moment, you didn't want, me to, you didn't want people to pay for their sins. They don't, they, you, you never wanted people to pay for their own sin. When sin comes, we think people, God is going to exact payment for sin because they deserve it. Get them. But... <laughs> But, God, but, but here Jesus reveals he never wanted payment for sin. He had to create a scenario under the old covenant until a time when Jesus would come. He created a scenario under the old covenant until a time when Jesus would come. But now we can find out a little bit about the old covenant that it didn't work. And so it says this, the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and it was useless. It could not make anyone perfect. But now Jesus, our high priest, Hebrews chapter 10, it says that this priest has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Oh, 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 oh. The old covenant couldn't make nothing perfect, but the new covenant, our high priest, by his will, we have been made holy. And this is, the, this is what Jesus spoke over you. He made you perfect forever. What does he say? A new covenant I will make with them in that day. I will put my, my, my thoughts or my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And then he says, in their sins and their wicked deeds, I will remember no more. It's a new covenant. I don't remember them, which means he didn't just forget them when you got born again and then he got his memory back. But it's an ongoing, as long as the new covenant is in place, that scripture continues to occupy and exact God's will so that every time you do something wrong, he forgot it again and he forgot it again and he forgot. He just forgot that you stopped listening to me and pulled up your Facebook page and started checking stuff. See, I remember it and let my wrath be upon you, but God forgot it. Woo! Put your phone down. Unless you're using it for the Bible and then get it out. Praise God. <laughs> You're all switching apps right now. You're like, oh. <laughs> and so Jesus said, this is a cup of a new covenant. With the old covenant, it didn't have a Christ or a cross in it. How many know that we can't take a little bit of the old covenant and put it in the new because we make a mess out of that new wineskin? The new wineskin cannot have old wine in it. It will burst. So we don't even put, Paul talked about it like this. He said, don't mix a little bit of the old with the new because a little bit of yeast works its way through the whole batch of dough. Now, we thought that meant that a little bit of sin works its way through the whole church, but he wasn't talking about it. Go back and read it. He was saying that if you try and throw a little bit of regulation back in, so this is what pastors preach. Well, you don't want to get too much into that gray stuff. You've got to have balance. So we put a little bit of the law with the, man, you're messing up your church and you're messing up people when you do that. Read the Bible, bro. You don't take a little bit of the old, don't even a little bit. Don't even mix even a little bit of the old law because God's trying to cleanse you and get you acting like Jesus with his will on the planet. Because what does Jesus do when he comes to a sinner city? He comes to a sinful city. Everybody was a sinner when Jesus walked the earth. Everybody. For none were righteous, not even one. So every city he went to would have been the equivalent of Sodom and Gomorrah, full of sin. 
And he walked in there, and what did he do? He began to exact disease on people and call down fire. No, he began to heal people because this was God's will for them, that his true divine nature would be revealed, that for the sinner, this is what God wants to do. He wants to heal them. Come here, blind man. God has been trying to heal you ever since you were born of your blindness. But finally, a man set his feet down on the planet and looked up to heaven and said, God, I'll do whatever you want. And God said, will you please go heal that blind man because I've been trying to get him healed ever since he was born. And Jesus walked over, boom, you're healed. Cripple man, get up. You got an issue of blood? Come here. And then he says, well, where's that tax collector? Ain't nobody likes and everybody's rejected him and everybody calls him a sinner. He's up in a tree. Zacchaeus, come down because this is God's intention. While man has rejected you because of your sin, God is pouring out his goodness on you and your whole family about to get saved. Now let me have some dinner with you. Wow. So we start to see what God's real response in divine nature is towards sin. In that this, the former regulation is set aside. It was weak. It was useless. Now, did God know that it was going to fail? Like, you think he was surprised that the old covenant didn't work? He was like, oh, man, well, that didn't work. We could come up with something new. He knew. He put it in place to educate us because we will forever try and behave enough in order to get God to like us and move in our lives. God bless me. I was good today. And this is what people do. And and today, the modern philosophy and thought is, if I do enough good to outweigh my bad, I'm probably going to be okay in the end. Look, you are not going to be okay in the end. Do enough good to outweigh the bad, that don't work. Right? You're going to perish. That kind of thought process, you're going to perish. You can't overcome all the evil with just good. You can't. It doesn't work. It's not a balancing act. So Jesus overcame all the sin took the punishment on the cross so that you simply believe in him and boom, you're righteous. Okay, so the old covenant looks like it was, it was weak, right? It was weak. So here's the old covenant. I want people to be righteous. That's what God's saying. And he's going to educate us. He's going to show us that we can't be good enough to get to him. So here, here, here he says this under the old covenant. See, see, the law came to amplify sin or make it bigger. So let me just give you one law, all right? I want Adam and Eve to behave, so don't eat from the tree. There, now you're righteous. Just don't do that one rule. But what does man do? We go and eat from the tree, right? So we couldn't even do one. Behave. So that's what, we, that's what churches do. That's what people do. We say, if I need you to behave, I just need to give you another rule. Let me throw more rules on you, and then you'll behave, right? And then you can be righteous through your behavior. So, so it, was, it couldn't make anyone perfect. A rule will never make anyone perfect because people can't do the rules. And so the reason that the law was a, or the old covenant was a shadow of things to come Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1, that the law was a shadow, is because the old covenant was imperfect, right? It wouldn't have to have a new covenant if the old covenant was perfect. It was imperfect. It could make no one perfect. It was a shadow because it had darkness mixed in with the light. Now, God is only light, so it was man that brought the darkness to it. So don't ever think that God came up with an old covenant and made a mistake. It was man that walked into the old covenant and became the mistake, right? What does the Bible say? That death entered through man. God didn't create death. We created death through our mistakes. So we walked up to God and shook his hand and said, we want to be in covenant with you and we'll do everything you say. And in that statement, we lied to him. So the old covenant was a shadow. The shadow has darkness and light in it. It wasn't God's idea to put a curse in the old covenant, but he had to because we brought the curse with us. So the shadow was, if you behave, you can have the blessing of God and his prosperity and all this goodness and you'll have life. If you don't behave, you're cursed. There's judgment, wrath, and condemnation. That's the old covenant. So what chases sin in the old covenant? A curse, punishment, and wrath. But Jesus became a curse on a tree, as it is written, curses any man who hangs on a tree, so that we might be free from the curse. So the new covenant doesn't have a curse in it because it was abolished. It's obliterated. So the new covenant is this. It's not based on your behavior, right? The behavior thing didn't work. God's like, oh, they're misbehaving again. Send them another law. 613 laws came down from Mount Sinai. And some of the laws, they make no sense at all. You're like, really? You have to come up with a law for that? Are you kidding me? I imagine the angels are like, really? You have to have a law for don't sleep with your animals? And God's like, look, look. And they're like, oh, my gosh, yeah. You got to have a rule for that too, I guess. Really? Because we're going to get them to behave through the rules. But he was showing us that, that the rules won't make us behave. So the new covenant is this. Here's life 
liberty, blessing, my promises, established on better promises and inheritance. You become a child of God. I'm going to put my spirit in you. And here's what you have to do. Believe in Jesus. Right? The Bible says, no, come on, give the Lord some praise right now. Okay, so, so the Bible says that, that he remembers our sins and our lawless deeds no more. Therefore, there is no sacrifice necessary for sins. In other words, you don't have to pay for sin. You can't pay for your own sin. Jesus took the payment in full. The Bible teaches us in Hebrews chapter 7 that Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, a guarantor in a contract means that they take care of all the payment on behalf of the beneficiary of the contract. We're the beneficiary. And Jesus holds the contract. He pays for it so that the beneficiary has absolutely no obligation or responsibility, but only benefits from the agreement. Jesus paid for it in full. He signed his name in blood. See, under the old covenant, you could break the covenant because the covenant was between man and God. But under the new covenant, you can't break the covenant because the covenant is between Christ and God, and he shares it with us. He's the guarantor. He's like, I got the payment. You just benefit. Praise the Lord Jesus. So he's writing his laws in our hearts and our minds. He remembers our sins no more. Romans chapter 5 and verse 16 says this. The judgment, we're going to start right here. The judgment followed one sin. So he's talking about the old covenant. What used to follow sin? Judgment. It followed it. It chased it. So this is the old covenant, 4,000 years, of looking at how sin was dealt with. Okay? Judgment followed sin and thereby condemnation. Okay? It brought it. But the gift... Now, what gift? The gift of grace. The the, the gift of grace. The the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6 that we, like them, were deserving, were by nature, let me say it again, but we were like them, by nature, deserving of God's wrath. In other words, remember when you weren't born again and you were a non-believer and you deserved wrath? Do you remember that? That's what he was saying, right? He goes all the way back. He says, remember when you were dead in your sins and transgressions? You lived according to the ways of this world and under the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit of which is now at work and those who are disobedient. And we also were like them when we ran around and satisfied the cravings of the flesh and followed its desires and thoughts. We were like them by nature deserving of wrath. You deserved it. So did I. What do we expect to happen on the end of sin? Boom, punish me. I deserve it. Remember when you were not born again and you deserved wrath? Do you remember that? Then it says this, but because of his great love, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. Is that scripture up there? Put that scripture up there. What does it say? Give me verse 6, Ephesians chapter 2. And God raised us up with, no, 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 uh, uh, oh, that is verse six. Okay, okay, go back a little bit. Go back a verse five or verse four. I got to find it. We're jumping around on my notes. I know she's so good. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in, no, no, go back one more. Made us alive with Christ. I know we were alive. I love it. Go back to three. And all, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the craziness of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature. Say by nature. By nature, you were deserving of wrath. What does he mean? He means you were born a sinner. You were, there was one sin that entered, Adam, and judgment followed one sin. Isn't that what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 16? There was judgment following. It was chasing one sin. We by nature, David said this, he was born a sinner. Didn't even matter. He said, he's like, yeah, I, I know. I slept with Bathsheba. I killed Uriah. I get it. But listen, I was born a sinner. I was born sinful. You were by nature deserving. You were born deserving wrath because you were in Adam when he sinned. You see that? So sin entered the world and it infected and impacted everyone so that judgment would follow the one sin. Now go back to Romans chapter 5 and verse 16. But the gift. Okay, so wait, wait. So it says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 that the gift is God's grace. We have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and this is the gift of God so that no one can boast. 
So I got a gift when I received and believed in Jesus. When you received and believed in Jesus, you got a gift, and the gift is called God's grace. It was a gift. It wasn't a wage. You didn't earn it. You didn't do anything to get it, but you got it for free by faith in Christ. It had nothing to do with your behavior. And so this is what he says now. And this is not for, oh, so she went to it, and this is not ourselves. This is a gift. Nor can the gift, that's God's grace, of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The, judge fo- the judgment followed one sin. What chased sin? Judgment and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many sins and brought justification. So under the new covenant, God is chasing sin with grace. He says a little bit later, he says, so that when sin abounds, grace increases even more. So we want... That when sin happens, punishment is coming, condemnation, wrath, and judgment is coming to that guy who who stabbed you in the back and stole your money out of the partnership and you got to get him. Well, you can't do that, man. God's wrath will come on you and his punishment's coming on you and you get him, Lord. But Jesus said, I need you to think differently, okay? So when people persecute you and steal and lie about you, just bless them and pray for them because I'm blessing you when they persecute you. Now, this is what Jesus did, right? When they wronged him, he's up on a cross and he says, what? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So when sin happens, the worst sin possible, they're crucifying the son of God. What chases sin? What's chasing sin now under the new covenant is not judgment. So when we see judgment, we should not think, oh, God is going to chase or when we that God is chasing sin instead. God, under the new covenant, because when Christ put his feet on this planet and came in the flesh, he started something new. And now he chases sin with the gift of grace. So that you used to disobey under the old covenant and God would chase you with the storm of Noah. You see, when you misbehave, God going to chase you down with a storm of destruction. Old covenant thinking. Now, when you misbehave, God is chasing you with a tidal wave of his goodness and grace. Come on, somebody. He's chasing your sin with grace and goodness. Why? It says in the end, the last scripture, I think it's Romans chapter 12 and verse 21. It says this, we overcome evil with good. That's his new strategy. The strategy is not to overcome evil with punishment, but to overcome evil with good. It's a shift, isn't it? So we we need to recognize that this is how God is behaving now. Now, it says in the the book of Hebrews that this high priest has sprinkled the blood and it speaks, his blood speaks a different word than the blood of Abel. Do we have that scripture? Here it is. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Say new covenant. It's new. It's new. It's just, it's different. It's not the old. We'll reprogram our thinking here. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It's a better word than the blood of Abel. So what did Abel's blood speak? Abel's killed by his brother Cain. He bleeds into the earth, and God says to Cain, I can hear your your brother's blood crying out to me from the ground. The blood is talking. And what was it saying? Man, avenge me. Right? Punish. Judge. Right? It's It's talking to the ground. Look what just happened to me. And so God has to say to Cain, look, the earth's not going to give you anything ever again because of, what you, because of the blood is talking. It's disqual- the, the, earth, the creation itself has disqualified you from getting any kind of production out of it at all. Right? Even when Adam sinned, God had to say to him, hey, cursed is the ground because of you. But he said to Cain, now the earth is iron and the heavens have become bronze. You get squat now because the blood is crying out to me, punish, avenge, revenge. But Christ's blood speaks a better word. What does Christ's blood say? It says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, I can either walk around with Adam's blood, with Cain's blood, with Abel's blood in me. See, I was born of Adam initially, so I've got that same blood in me that cries out, boom, revenge, get them, God. 
But now that I'm a believer, I don't have that blood flowing through my veins anymore. I have the blood of Jesus Christ and it speaks a better word. And I need to align my mouth and my thinking and my heart and my emotions to what Jesus' blood is saying. And Jesus' blood says, you wronged me, but it's okay, I love you, I forgive you. Now, Jesus got up on the cross and his blood was saying what? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, they're killing him. They're spitting on him. They're they're taunting him and insulting him. And his blood's hitting the ground and saying, forgive them. Redemption. I don't need payment for how they wronged me. I don't need payment for their sins. God, you never wanted them to pay for their sins. I'm here to pay for their sins. See, if I were up on the cross and they were yelling at me, why don't you come down from there, son of God, and and rescue yourself? I'd have, man, I'd have pulled them. I'd have just gotten down. I'd have whooped them. I'd have... Tell you, can I just tell you right now? I'd have gone down and beat them. I'd be like, get some fire down here, blow them up, boom. <laughs> Praise God, I wasn't up on that cross because I'd have smote them all. <laughs> right? You talking to me, man? You know who I am? <laughs> so I've got to get my blood, the deepest part of me, in alignment with what Christ is saying if I want to see the kind of power that God moves through Christ. I got to want what he wants. And what does he want? How is he dealing with sin on this planet? With his goodness. The goodness of God leadeth one unto repentance. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Wow. I was at American Airlines uh, yesterday. Oh, I don't want to mention the name of the... (laughs) My apologies. (laughs) Some other airline. And... (laughs) And I was doing carry-on because I was, my wife and I were preaching in Sacramento on Friday and Saturday, and then we had to fly. I had to be back here Sunday night at 5 to preach, or Saturday night at 5 to preach just last night. So my, our flight was getting in at 4, so we carry-on, because I don't want to do the carousel dance. We do the carry-on. So you buy a carry-on bag, right? So I got a carry-on bag, and then you're walking, but you, you still dread that moment that as you're walking by, and the, and the people there go, excuse me, sir. Is that your carry-on? Yeah. I've seen people, have you ever seen people walking by with like a, it's a carry-on this big? And they just walk on by. I got this little thing, it's not that bad, man. I think I'm like an inch over the, because none of the carry-ons will actually fit in their little thing that they say is carry-on size. But she says to me, I'm going to need you to put that in the thing. I don't think that'll fit. Sir, I'm going to have to check that bag. I... I worked out my entire wardrobe and our entire trip around the idea that I would not have to check a bag. I shoved everything in this little thing and inconvenienced myself so that I would not have to check a bag. And now you're saying I might have to check a bag? So I began to explain to this woman about the new covenant. I said, sister, I think you're mistaken. What is your name? She said, Moses. And I was like, oh, I'm in trouble now. (laughs) And I put that thing in there, and she looked at it, and it did not size up properly, so she judged it. And she cast my bag into outer darkness (laughs) where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I had to go and do the carousel dance after we we got here just in time, and God, God worked everything out. I think sometimes we believe that our lives, even after we become believers, that we're walking around and God is sizing us up to see if we're fitting properly in his confines and behaving the way he thinks we should behave. And then we're worried that he's going to see us out of bounds. And in that moment, he's going to judge you. That judgment's going to come. But now what follows our sin is God's grace and not his judgment. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Checking the time. So what of the unbelievers? Have they escaped the wrath of God? A non-believer? The Bible says that we as believers have escaped the wrath of God. What of the non-believer? What was Paul talking about when he said, remember when you were like them? You did what this kind of stuff they did? 
and you deserved God's wrath. Even by nature, you were born a sinner and you deserved it. Did God not wait for you? Did he not rescue you and make you alive? Was his response to punish you for your sin? Or was his response to wait for you to find you, to call you to him so that you might be set free and made alive in Christ? You see, you deserved wrath, but he reserved wrath. He set it aside because he wishes none would perish, but all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. When Sodom and Gomorrah was under attack because of their great sin, God had a conversation with Abraham, and Abraham said, would you spare the place if there were just 50 righteous? And God said, if there were 50 righteous in that city, I would spare the whole place for their sake. Yeah. Now, there's a picture there, because, of course, if it were just 10 or even 1, it would still be the same. Jesus tells a parable about wheat and weeds, and it's a picture of the lost and the righteous have grown up together in the same field. And isn't that the field we live in today? And the servants said to the master, do you want us to pull the weeds and burn them now? And the master said, no, let's wait till the end and we'll harvest them all in the last moment. Paul said this, O oh, unrepentant hearts, and this is for the non-believer, don't you know you are storing up wrath for yourself? Say storing not being dispensed, storing up wrath for yourself, which will be dispensed in the day of wrath. You may, the unbeliever may deserve it, but God has reserved it. The unbeliever may deserve it, but God has reserved it. Let me show it to you in another way. You see, God has asked us to spread, spread out across this nation, across this world, right? Spread out to the right, to the left, to the north, to the south. That's the righteous. And so wherever you are is safe from God's wrath. You see that? See, when I ride an airplane, everybody on that plane is safe because I'm there. I'm not saying that in arrogance. I know I'm in the righteousness of God. Okay. And God has asked us, Christ has asked us to be the salt of the earth, which means we're the preservative of the planet. Okay. So I want to show this to you right now. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. Okay, so under the old covenant, judgment followed sin. Is that right? Under the new covenant, there is no judgment for sin until after death. In other words, and we're believers. How many know that we're believers? So when God declared you righteous, he judged you in that moment, just so you know. That was your judgment. He heard all the evidence. He found out you had faith in Christ, and he declared you righteous. You've been called not guilty. You're done. You're finished. You're in eternity. You're in. Say, I'm in. I'm in. Written in the Lamb's Book of Life, done. Okay? But for the non-believer, there's a waiting. God wishes that none would perish, so his, in his great mercy, he just waits. He's waiting. He's not judging He's not pouring out his When you see calamity happen on this earth, it's not God's judgment. God said this, if someone attacks you, I didn't do it. Amen. Isaiah chapter 54, under the new covenant, when there's an attack, whether it's a hurricane, a volcano, fire, somebody's pulling out a gun and being a numbskull, God's saying, I didn't do that. I had nothing to do with it. Okay? And so, so we don't speak, oh, God is doing that. Instead, we speak against what Satan is trying to work in our nation or work on our planet. Oh, Lord, there's power on that. Did you get that? Okay, so if anyone does attack you, it will not be to my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. But, but the scripture says this. Judgment follows death. In other words, now listen to me, and I'll close with this. Not one single person since Christ hit this planet has been judged and killed by God since Christ hit here. I don't, I don't think God ever killed anybody. But I can tell you for a fact that judgment doesn't happen until after someone dies. 
So we've got to get that out of our hearts and out of our minds forever. Even for the non-believer, God is not judging any. You might think they deserve it, and they do. They deserve it, but it is reserved because God is trying to save them. He's trying just in the same way he waited for you, he's waiting for them. In the same way he's waiting for you, he's waiting for them. So should not our hearts burn with the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone who is still breathing air and say, you've escaped it till now, brother, but can I help you escape it in eternity? Can I bring the message? See, my mom was over at my house on Halloween and we were talking to our neighbors and my mom said, hey, I noticed that you're talking about the, the church a little bit to your neighbors. I said, yeah, we've got some pamphlets here. He's like, she's like, oh, is that what tonight's about is to really help and then bring neighbors to the Lord? I said, absolutely. As soon as she got that fire in her, I'll tell you what, she walked around the table, she stood out in my driveway and everybody that's walking, she starts preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to all my neighbors as they're walking up. Mom, what are you doing? Come here. This is my neighbors. You're freaking them out. Settle down. Should not our hearts burn like my mom for the lost? Man, can I just say, because it is, it is, it is a fire. Why is it? There's a fearful expectation of judgment and eternal fire, raging fire. That's what the Bible says. But as long as I'm breathing, God is not punishing me. He is chasing me with his grace. He is leading me by goodness to repentance. It is the goodness of God that overcomes evil. And this has to be our mouth. So now stand up with me. We've got some work to do because we are a church now that has been set free entirely by the idea that what's been happening in our nation and the attacks we've seen are from God. We can say for sure without a shadow of a doubt by the scripture I bore out and the word of the Lord that I spoke to you that none of it is God's will. God is not sending our nation a message. So now listen, which means that the enemy is attacking our nation and trying to bring fear to us. And I don't know what he's so worried about that's got him all fired up, but he's got all kinds of calamity happening all over our nation. And if that is not the will of the Lord, then I'm going to speak what God wants me to speak, which is protection over our nation. And let us be the church that this morning speaks protection and comfort to our nation to thwart the plans of the devil. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 says that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power to go about doing good and setting those free and healing those who were oppressed by the devil. We have an enemy. Let's talk against him. Let's speak prosperity to our nation and safety. Let's release the power of God to do what he wills to do. Let's be the man that manifests a miracle on this planet. Agree with me in prayer now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we speak your will into our nation. Thwart the plans of the enemy now. Father God, invade and speak clearly to the hearts of your people to identify what the enemy's trying to do and to report it. Lord, to get the enemy's plans and completely thwarted. That none of Satan's plans will prosper in this nation. In Jesus' name, we declare safety and protection over this nation now. Let your goodness reign. Let your prosperity flow to us now. Let your redemptive grace be the gift that follows the sins of this nation in Jesus' name. And as sin increases, Lord, we know your gracious abounds even more. We declare comfort to the families who have been impacted by fire. Comfort to the families who have been impacted by death. Lord, heal them and restore them and restore double to what's been stolen to this nation in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to have you remain standing for just a moment. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you if you want to. I have a prayer that you can pray. And in this prayer, you become a child of God and enter into the kingdom of God and enter into eternity. And so a man came to Jesus in the middle of the night. It's nobody moving around right now. This is super, the most important part of the service to me. A man came to Jesus in the middle of the night and he said, how can somebody enter the kingdom of God? How can somebody have eternal life? And that's what I've been talking about today. 
And Jesus said this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that who would ever believe in him? Right? The old covenant was whosoever would behave. But the new covenant is whosoever would believe in him, would not perish but have everlasting life. That's for you today. God called you here. It's not an accident that you came in this morning. He, he planned this. This was not your idea. This was his idea. And ever since you walked in, something was stirring on the inside of your heart. And when we pray this prayer, you open that door. So let's all pray together. Everyone repeating after me. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. And I ask you, Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Father God, baptize me in your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.